Okay, so today what we're going to do is we're going to finish the DC motor transfer functions, do problems, right? And I don't think I'll get to the nonlinear system stuff like the last part today. Just I'll get it uh, get to it on Monday, right? So let's do this. this is more important. So recall that uh, this is where we left off. That is here is the electrical part. Here is the quote unquote electromechanical part, the back EMF generated by the rotor, and here is the mechanical part, right? So like it was a nice discussion we had. All right, so like the nice discussion we had after the background noise is uh, here is the system of equations, right, which we came up with, and we said 4 involves omega of t from the back EMF. We eliminated that uh, by saying omega is d theta dt because that's what we want. Yes, we want theta of s over ea of s, and then we said that the armature current or the output torque, the shaft torque is proportional to the armature current. So we eliminated the current, okay? Now as far as the torque is concerned, we correctly said that, all right, for, oops, for determining the shaft torque, we said, okay, here is the electrical cyclomatic. Let's assume that the, shaft has an inertia and dampening and there is no torsional rotation there's no spring necessary if you think about it so here is the relation between torque and theta dot theta double dot and theta dot so now what we have to do is we have to combine uh, this equation and this equation and just get the transfer function so let's do that right. so basically Is that, that. There you go. All right. So uh, let's call this number two. Let's call this number one. So uh, two in one implies what? One over kT j times R a. I'm going to put the constants up front. Okay. Uh, let's see. Tm. Let me just do. Let me just do this. Let's do it step by step. J theta double dot plus d theta dot, which is my Tm times R A over K T plus K B theta dot equals E A of T. Yes. That was just going to be math. So let's do the math. So this is going to be J, J R A over K T theta double dot plus K B plus D R A over K T theta dot equals E A. Yes? Just math again. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to divide throughout, I mean, I want to mul uh, multiply and I want to factor out a JRA over KT, okay? So if I do that, I'm going to get JRA over KT, and you'll see why I do this, okay? Data double dot, plus here, I'm going to get KT over JRA, J times RA, of course. Uh, let's do this. Curly braces, this is parentheses. KB plus D times RA over KT, Theta dot equals E A. Okay. So this is theta double dot plus K T over J R A times K B plus D R A over K T. Uh, theta dot equals K T ah, over J times R A E A. Yes. All right, now let's take the Laplace transform, assuming zero initial conditions because we are computing the transfer function. So what do you get? What is the Laplace transform of this? It's S square. Wow, man. It's S square over S, correct? Plus uh, K 
kt i'm just going to write out the constants over jra kb plus d times ra over kt s theta of s what's the problem with this thing let's see this is brackets here equals actually i don't need the brackets there i'm going to put the bracket in kt over JRA, which is also a constant, EA of S. Okay? So, what are we looking for? We are looking for the output sh shaft angular displacement over the input DC voltage that's equal to KT over <coughs> RA times J over, let's see. So, factor out and theta here, that's good, but then I can factor out an S here and say it's S times S plus KT over JRA times KB plus DRA over KT. So here it is. And let's 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 do this. Let's do one more one more step. Okay, one more step. This is correct. I hope. <laughs> let's find out. So let's write it like the book writes it. KT over R A J divide by S times S plus what? Uh, let me multiply this inside. What do I get? I get KT. So what I'm actually going to do is I'm only I'm going to write it in the form the book has, okay? Just to compare. I'm just going to take KT over RA and multiply it in. I'm going to leave the 1 over J outside, the parentheses. So there's just going to be 1 over J. So what do I get? I get KT, KB over RA, yes? And then if I multiply it here, the KTs cancel, the RA cancels. So I'll basically get D plus KT, KB over RA, yes? So this is my theta of S over EA of S. And so let's see, here it is. Okay. So if you look in the book, uh, fire this up. So let's copy the equation from the book. And while it's opening up, oh, it's already open. Awesome. We're going to modeling in the frequency domain. Maybe one. Here it is. Just copy this. Okay. I can't take a snapshot. I'll just. I'm going to take a snapshot. Come on. Take a snapshot. It's not letting me. So, anyway. So, here is the equation. So, you could. Visualize it's KT over RA JM. So I have J instead of JM and D instead of DM, but here it is, okay? And if Scott is, Scott's not here, but yesterday he asked a great question. Can I remember these constants? And my answer is it's tough, right? But notice we said alpha over S times S plus beta, right? So we're gonna, we're gonna remember this as K over S times S plus alpha. This K and alpha, I'll give you on the exam. It's actually hard to remember this. You can do a units check, okay? But it's difficult. The point is you got to remember the form. Here. So this is correct, right? Let's see if I can do both of these at the same time. Look. 
comparison sake since I can't copy and paste apparently. There. Oh, beautiful. So KT over RAJ, that's what we have here. KT over RAJM, 1 over JMD plus KTKB over RA. Okay? I don't expect you to know the derivation for the exam. So we'll do problems based on this. And we'll probably get to it on um, Monday. Okay? All right, so since I have the book open, let's look at this. Okay. Any questions on this? Okay. So, I don't want these bookmarks. Now, what you can do is we can combine what we just learned with what we have learned before. That is, we can go through a gear ratio, right? Then, the equivalent impedance, this is your output shaft, yes? Would be these impedances reflected onto the output shaft, but added to the inertia and the dampening, the impedances of the motor, yes? That's exactly what is being done here. So, JM, oops, the net inertia on the shaft is the inertia associated with the motor, yes? Plus, this inertia reflected onto this axis is the number of teeth on the destination shaft divided by the number of teeth on the source shaft squared. That's it, okay? So what, let's do this. Over the next couple of days, including Monday, we'll do some problems, right? A lot of problems on this because let's look at the schedule. Um, let's see. Mm -hmm. Come on, slow book. All right. So like I said, we have like some time over the next couple of weeks. We actually have lots of time. I designed this course so we can all practice problems. Come on, come on. All right, so we are here. So I can basically, so notice how I have like two extra lectures, right? So it's to practice more problems. So let's start practicing problems. Uh, let's see. Oh, before we do that, there's one more thing, just reading through this. There's something called as the torque speed curve, right? There is, in other words, how do you find these constants? So here, there are some constants here, right? RA, like it was suggested correctly, you can just take an ohm meter, right? Stick it across the DC motor terminals, you can measure the resistance, right? But the question is, how do you measure KT and KB? So the answer is, if you go back to our equation here, there is our time domain. It's not here. So let's go back to our equation. So right here. So let's look at this guy. J data double dot. So I hope he has it here. Ta, ta, ta. Yeah, here it is. So here is the this equation, okay, our time domain converted into the S domain. So what do you have is Tm of S, these are constants, plus Kb S theta of S equals Ea of S. It's exactly what we have here. So let me actually see if you can see that. Yeah, good. So let me zoom in. Okay. So notice this equation here, okay, and this equation. You see, the equation in the book is the Laplace transform of this equation, yes? But then what your dynamometer does is you basically put a constant, and then he goes back again to the time domain. All right, great. So, because you do this in the time domain. So what you do is you put a constant input voltage, right? you measure shaft velocity by applying a known load. So here it is, okay? So basically, in this equation, can be rewritten like this, yes? Torque as a function of omega, you see that? So when you apply a constant voltage in, this is a straight line equation, yes? With a negative slope, you see that? Torque is function of omega, negative slope. So you apply two voltages, all right? You're going to get two straight lines. 
So to compute these constants, again, RA, you can find out by basically doing an ohmmeter measurement, if you want. However, notice what you really need is KT over RA, yes? So we go back to these equations here. If you go back to the transfer function, you really don't need KT and RA separately, right, to find the constants. What you need is KT over RA, yes? So what I have, that's what exactly they do here. So you put a known voltage in, you measure the no load velocity, which is the X intercept, yes? That is, when there is no load connected, you measure what is the output speed. So that's when you plug in omega m equals zero here, you get the no load velocity, sorry, ah, when you plug in Tm equals zero, right? You get the no load velocity as Ea over Kb, yes? This can be measured. This is known, this Ea, because that's the voltage you put in, yes? You can find Kb. Any questions on that? Use a dynamometer for this. And the y-intercept is when omega m is zero. That is, you stall the output shaft. How much torque you need to stall it. That's your stall torque, yes? So now, in this equation, you make omega m equals zero, yes? You know the stall torque. You know what voltage you're putting in. You can measure KT over RA. That's it. And if you want to find KT, if you know the winding resistance, you can find KT, right? And people usually do this, actually, because the reason is they want to know how much torque can be generated, right? And the torque generated is proportional to what? The input voltage or the armature current? The current, remember that, right? It's not the voltage. It's a common mistake which people make. So that's it. In the sense, uh, if you look at the example problems, we'll do these, pro oh, here's one, right? I don't have to scroll to the end. So let's see, skill assessment exercise. Uh, here is an example. So we'll do this actually on Monday, right? This is, if you want, you can try this before Monday. So this is the exact exercise we're going to do. So I'll either give you an equation or like you see in the questions, a plot will be given. So this is your, the velocity when there is no load, okay? And this is the stall torque. This is your input voltage. From here, you can find the motor constants. Sometimes I might even give you the resistance. Right? I don't know. It depends on the question. And then here is the system. And I can ask you, find, just be careful. The transfer function here is theta L over Ea, all right? The transfer functions we were finding is the displacement of the angular displacement of the motor shaft, right? So you have to go back and think about how to reflect impedances. That's all. Is that clear? We'll do this on Monday, this entire problem. But uh, for now, let's examine. So the, actually, today's lecture is going to be uh, very short, which is fine, because A, you have a uh, job fair today. But B, it's also like it's a little dense, so I want you to digest this. So let's look, let's decipher all this by looking at this high-level example. I don't think this is in your book. Just fine. Let's look at this. All right. So theta of s over Ea of s is of this form. Yes, k over s times s plus alpha. Yes? So remember a couple of lectures ago, we said uh, what form of, what function is theta of t in the time domain? If I put a dc in, what happens to the output shaft? Well, it keeps on spinning, yes? So that means uh, theta of t is a ramp, correct? Omega is a constant, yes? And we guess the function should be of the type k over s or alpha over s. I said it's of, there's an s plus alpha there. So let's see if this still satisfies what we think happens physically, right? And if you think about it, it should, because when you write this as a partial fraction expansion, right, and take the inverse, this part leads to a decaying exponential in the time domain. Why is it decaying? Because this is positive, yes? So let's just check that. That's all we're going to do for today. So assume, 
for simplicity, E A of S is going to be one over S. That is, I put a one volt step input, so E A of T is simply going to be U of T. Okay, it's a step one volt. I can make this like a non-unity constant, but it's just constant. It doesn't do anything right? in the sense it doesn't affect the form of the transfer function. For simplicity, I assume it's one. All right, now let's compute theta of s. Therefore, let's call this one again. So one implies what's theta of s? It's k over s times s plus alpha times one over s. Yeah. So again, please check my work, right? So it's k over s squared times s plus alpha. Yeah. So what's the partial fraction expansion of this? What's the form? A over s plus what? Which implies uh, let sorry p over s squared plus c over s plus alpha. Okay. Now you can use your calculators if you want. If you have it, just do a, a x. I forgot how do you do partial fraction on the TI-89. I think it's expand. Is it? Let's find out. <laughs> I have the emulator on here. Because if we have done enough practice, I'm sure you know how to do this. Oh, I'm going to suffer because I don't have a nice key. Huh? Yeah, next exam, question Tim asked, next exam, are load calculators? Yeah, because the computations get pretty hairy. Yeah, I know, I have an emulator, so don't laugh. Have to. <laughs> See. Beautiful. Expand what? So it was k over s squared s. Nope, I can't use that. So I have to squared times high. No, it's not high. It's times s so apparently, I can't type, type brackets in here. Yes. Ah. Uh, what the hell? How did this happen? <laughs> Come on, die. All right. All right, guys. You probably did this faster than I, than I did. Anybody got it? So I'm going to quit because there's no way I can type this in. Turn off the emulator. Anybody did this on the emulator? I mean, calculators? So you can use the expand function. Yeah, put expand on this with symbolics. What'd you get? K over S squared? Okay. Alpha, right? Yeah, you can. TI-89, yes. Chris's question was, can you, TI-89 can handle symbolic. Like I told you, my friend from Stanford, or my acquaintance, I don't know him that well anymore, Ryan, he basically finished his entire PhD on the TI-89. Just to prove a point, you don't need MATLAB or Mathematica. It was funny. It's very powerful. Right. So you can do a quick check. This looks right, okay? All right, let's take the inverse Laplace transform of this. Therefore, theta of t is what? K times what? No, no, no. T, uh, uh, of t. I'm going back into the time domain. Step function, all right? So let's do this, okay? Let's be, you guys are all getting it right. So let's put a U of t on the outside. There's going to be U of t coming from all of them, right? So tell me this first. Okay, let's put this. This is the most important one. So what is the inverse Laplace transform of 1 over s squared t? Okay, The u of t is outside. Minus 1 plus what? e to the minus alpha t. Okay? Let's check. So notice, so you, I always, and you should always do this, theta, check this 0. Okay, so what is it at zero plus? The function? What's the value? It's, it's just starting, right? So what is it? If you plug in zero there, I mean it's zero plus, right after zero, what do you get? Huh? Zero. 
Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, I know. And if you get a wonder, you're screwed, right? You made a mistake. Because there's, there's, there's like, when you're in your model, is that clear? That looks good. So what is theta as t goes to infinity? Is that, does that make sense? Is what? Somebody said it, they got it right. It's fine if you make a mistake. So as t goes to infinity, what happens? Huh? So what happens as t goes to infinity? Uh, alpha is positive, right? So as t goes to infinity, what happens to this? That dies out, so what do you get? You get t minus one, right? K times t minus one, and this is also correct, right? It's low, it's a ramp. Question, Chris? Yeah, this is one, this is zero. Yeah, okay. So it's the way I've written it, right? See that? Okay, okay. All right, so this form of the transfer function is good, right? So let's do one more, in the sense, let's do an omega. So, but then, so is this clear? This form of the transfer function agrees with the physics. If it doesn't agree, you should discard this and go back and figure out what went wrong. Right? We're not done yet. Let's do an omega of s check. So we know that theta of s over ea of s is of the type k over s times s plus alpha. Yeah? So now, let's, let me, this implies that s theta of s over ea of s is k over s plus alpha. Right? I, because the reason why I'm writing it like this is I know s times theta of s is what? What can I write it as? But tell me, therefore, let's call this 2. 2 implies what? So what is s theta of s? In the s domain, what is it? It's omega of s, yes? So here it is. Here's my transfer function. Omega of s over a of s over k over s plus, s plus alpha. And I'm not going to do this in the sense... Let's say you put the same input voltage, you get k over s plus alpha times 1 over s. Actually, let's just quickly do it. So this is k over s times s plus alpha, yeah? So what's the partial fraction expansion of this? Let's see if we can guess this. There's going to be a minus here. So let me put s plus alpha minus s. I need, there you go. Okay, that's what I claim it is. And you can check this. So you put it under a common denominator. You get S times S plus alpha, S plus alpha minus S. So you get an alpha on the top. I don't want an alpha on the top. I want a K on the top, yes? So I multiply by K over alpha, so the alphas cancel. Uh, I believe, I claim this is what you're going to get. And does this make sense? So what's omega of T then? It's K over alpha times what? So what's the inverse lapse? Uh, so... This is u of t in the sense this is 1 minus e to the minus alpha t. Yes? So again, check. What's omega of 0 plus? So right when you start, what's the angular velocity? 0. That makes sense because you're just starting. Yeah? But what is omega as t goes to infinity? K or alpha, that also makes sense. Remember, it, it's constant velocity. Right? So good. So model is. These are the only checks we can do. Acceleration. Well, at steady state, if the velocity is constant. What's the acceleration? Zero. And you, okay, fine. That makes sense. But physically, right? You can see the shaft keeps on spinning. So the theta keeps on linearly increasing. But that's what you will see in 3720. That what you do is you do a, your counters. Your digital counters, which you sample them in, they have finite width, right? So it's basically after 16 bits, it'll go back to zero again. So it's a mod 16 counter. That's what they call it. So although in reality, your thing is continuously spinning, right? When you do a digital control, you have to like stop after a certain angle, right? So how many times you rotate, like uh, 360 degrees, one revolution, two pi radians, or 720 degrees, which is two revolutions, okay? Depends on not only the width of your counter, right? Also how fast your shaft is turning, right? Because for the same width, if you turn slower, you can have more revolutions, right? 
Make sense? Just depends on your application. That you will do in 3720. Right? So that's about it for DC motors. In the sense, now we're going to do quite a few problems. Right? Uh, any questions? So there are a couple of concerns about exam performance. But like I said, don't worry about it too much. In the sense, let's go back to your uh, schedule. I'm guessing that all of you, based on the questions I've been getting, and what the heck happened to my keyboard? Did I turn it off? No, I didn't. Right. Based on the questions I've been getting, uh, I think uh, this is what's going to happen, that you're going to do really well on the final, right? And that's usually what happens. So your lowest midterm is going to be only 20%. However, you're all doing well on the homeworks, and you're going to have extra credit, just like this exam, on the next midterm and on the final. So keep working on it. And I don't think anybody has a I think almost everyone, well, I think every one of you can get an E still. So don't worry about it too much. But you got to practice, right? So we'll do that in lecture. So starting on Monday, I'm going to do this problem. So go through it, right? And uh, compare, like, when we when I do it on Monday, compare to how you did it. And I'll try to get in, back into MATLAB and all that stuff, right? I don't know how I'm going to do this, but I'll get back into MATLAB. Because there are, oh, so since we have a little bit of time, let me just address this, right? So I will, since we're looking at the physics, I mean, the in, intuitive concepts behind this, uh, note that when you have theta of s, over Ea of s equals k over s times s plus alpha, what you can make out of this is what is called as a pole zero or pz plot. Okay, So basically, the poles are defined as the values of s, and we're actually getting into control theory a little bit, but that's fine. It's good to look at this intuitively. Values of s that so result, so values of S, so poles, let's call this S subscript P, that result in our transfer function, theta of SP over EA of SP. So if we evaluate at the pole, it tends to infinity, okay? In other words, that's why it's called as a pole in the sense or roots of denominator. That is, for a polynomial transfer function. So in other words, if this goes to 0, this thing goes to infinity, yes? And zeros are defined correspondingly. That is, they are the roots of the numerator, or they're the values of s that make the transfer function go to 0. That's why it's called zeros, right? So for this transfer function, where are the finite poles and zeros? That is, you can plot this on the real imaginary axis, yes? Complex plot. Why? Because S is a complex number. So this is called as, this is the finite PZ plot. That is, finite values of S. I'm not considering S going to infinity, okay? Because in complex functions, infinity is, quote unquote, you have to be careful because you, there are two ways you can go to infinity. Go to infinity this way, you can go to infinity on the imaginary axis as well. So we're not worried about the infinite poles and zeros. So looking at this guy, what are the finite values of S that make the numerator go to zero? Are there any? No, there aren't any. Yes? So there are no finite zeros. Okay? Are there any finite poles? Yes. Where are they? Exactly, 0 and negative alpha. So you indicate on this diagram by an x. x means its pole, a little circle. This is the notation not only I, we use, MATLAB also uses. Okay, MATLAB has a kind called PZ plot. Right? But there's something important I want you to see here. Right? So here is the one pole. I'm going to assume the pole is at negative alpha for sure because alpha is positive. Yes, it's all positive numbers. So this is an example of a marginally stable system. So we're talking about stability. That's because you have a pole at the origin. It's a 1 over s term. You agree that 1 over s means there's a pole at the origin. Remember in the time domain, what does 1 over s operation? In terms of mathematical operations, I'm not talking about the Laplace transform of U of t. Okay? What mathematical operation gives a 1 over, in the time domain gives a 1 over s in the s domain? You remember? In an integrator, right? So think about it, right? So in other words, the DC motor acts as an integrator, 
because it's got a pole at the origin and you can see that effect when you talk about theta over ea right so if you put a step for ea you integrate the step you get a ramp right that's exactly what theta of s is it has a ramp so these are the kind of intuitive things you have to start thinking about right so in other words from the transfer function how do i predict the time domain behavior if you have a pole at the origin you have an integrator okay let me ask you this if this pole was in the right half plane suppose you got s minus alpha you think that's correct what does that tell you so when you have s plus alpha you had an e to the minus alpha t yes if this was over here what does this look like e to the alpha t so what does that tell you it will keep growing exponentially your system is unstable you made a mistake right in the sense in the physical model because your physical dc motors are unstable right i'm like wait it is unstable no 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 in the sense the shaft is continuously rotating that does not mean the system is unstable right marginally stable let me write this in red system okay stability is a system property it's not a transfer function property you got to remember that so what happens with feedback is you have unstable systems like your maglev right you want to levitate it at a point maybe i'll bring it in on monday and show you the digital maglev so it doesn't it's unstable right? it just sticks or it falls so it has a actually it has two poles one in the left half plane there's a symmetrical pole in the right half plane so you use control theory to move this pole via feedback into the left half plane it's kind of cool right you can actually look at it using root locus that's my favorite method you can see how it like moves that's one technique that's what we're primarily going to cover if you want to do practical control systems root locus that's 3720 right it's a fun method but it's 3720 but if you want to do that's one that's called classic control okay this is classic control you look at pole zeros you see how they move and all that stuff but most practical systems are multiple degrees of freedom right so that's where this came So let's say you work in aerospace for um, Rockwell Collins or Lockheed Martin, right? I don't know if Raytheon still exists. I think they do exist. Raytheon, they all do this state space control. Right? Aircraft control systems are classic examples of state space control. That's actually how state space developed the arms race, okay? The space race. The Russians actually figured it out before the Americans, but they didn't publish it for a long time, right? Like a lot of people associated with this, but. So there are two main branches of control theory: classic control, which is very intuitive, and that uses pole zero plots. All right, state space control. I would not say it's not intuitive, but compared to classic control, it's not really intuitive. But it's very powerful. Right, I will only touch upon this in 3050 and 3720. There is state space, because state space is a little involved. All right, it involves like linear algebra and stuff. But anyway, where the class again is going is we'll do a lot of problems. Uh, and then we are going to get a little bit into state space again look at this pole zero system response we kind of looked at a preview of this when we looked at system response okay right here in the time domain where the pole zeros are but that's about it right in third zone 20 what you will learn is you will learn basically learn what is called root locus that will allow you using negative feedback to move whatever unstable i don't want to say unstable right half plane poles you have into the left half plane oh by the way um Let me go back to black. This is called RHP, or right half plane. Okay, this is called LHP, or left half plane. It's terminologies it gets thrown out, right? In Florida. All right, I'll see you Monday. Oh, yeah, this class gets like really fun in my opinion from now.